I think this was already a great uh, start, and I thank very much uh, former President CDEO and especially uh, our friend Emery Lovins for these uh, insights. And I don't know how you felt about this, uh, especially all these um, compelling facts about the opportunity to really um, um, move on with the global energy transition. Um, it's just very, very obvious that we are not lacking the technologies, not even the ideas, and that we are maturing in the global energy transition. But we are here in Japan in the months of June also because um, of a very important political gathering. And um, there's no doubt that uh, politicians of the uh, G20 countries are shaping um, the uh, global energy transition in one way or the other. And how they do this um, is um, very important in terms of, <coughs> excuse me, in very, very important in terms of the time that um, uh, we have to really um, embrace this uh, global energy transition. And um, heading towards a new climate and sustainable economy refers to uh, a um, important subject that's been discussed at the G20 gatherings. And that is the question of how we invest into new roads, new airports, new power plants, new um, infrastructure indeed. So the question of infrastructure really is at the heart of the discussions um, of the finance ministers of the G20 countries and of the heads of state of the G20 countries. The new climate economy has calculated some two years ago a, a compelling number of some 90 trillion US dollars to be invested uh, within the next um, 12 years um, into these new infrastructures. And the question, of course, is if we get this wrong now, if we invest into technologies that are not uh, in line and not really helping us with the global energy transition, then this is basically cemented or um, um, uh, determining um, the future for the next couple of decades. So it really is important how we um, uh, channel these infrastructure investments, these trillions indeed, and how we shift this uh, trillions. And I'm really excited to have two of the um, really global ambassadors of sustainability um, here with us today in, um, um, in this room. Um, and um, I'd like uh, to introduce to you to um, Mr. Hiroshi Kumiyama, who is the chairman of the Mitsubishi Research Institute and a co-chair of the T20. Mr. Hiroshi, please join us. And please welcome Mr. Hiroshi. Thank you very much. It seems that I've been invited onto the stage first. How do I? Thank you very much. Innovation toward a decarbonized society. This will be the topic. Uh, first of all, saturation is the reality, the most important concept. In the 20th century, at a rapid speed all over the world, human activity exploded. As a result, in the advanced economy, saturation really has become a reality. Uh, this is an example of Japan's uh, steel industry. There is uh, so-called urban mines. How much uh, steel is being accumulated in Japan? This is the total amount of steel that exists in Japan. In the 1950s and 60s, about half a century ago, there was very little amount of steel in Japan. What does that mean? There were no large uh, units of automobiles uh, nor buildings. But in the 1960s and 70s, Japan underwent high economic uh, growth, and the number of uh, automobiles surged. And of course, the number of uh, buildings also rose, but then they saturate. And that is where we are right now. Well, then, 
How much is the total amount of steel that exists in this uh, country? 10 ton per person, more precisely 10.4 tons per person. Most of the advanced countries have similar levels of uh, steel per person. Uh, they're at a point of saturation. When will uh, the global uh, point of saturation look at China? As of three years ago, uh, as of 2016, uh, the number is seven tons per person. It's reaching eight ton. Uh, by 2025, uh, China, with respect to automobiles and uh, buildings and the steel contained in these, uh, they will come to a point of saturation as well. What about the whole world? Uh, it's said uh, that the world will reach a point of saturation in terms of uh, steel volume in 2050. This includes Africa and countries like India. What happens if a point of saturation is reached? And that is most crucial. To give you the conclusion first, we will no longer require iron ore. Iron in air uh, would rust. So iron ore uh, is... Uh, Ferrous oxide. So what we're doing is removing oxygen uh, from iron ore. Uh, that is uh, the process of steel making. Now once uh, iron is turned into steel, you cannot discard it. A car, uh, once uh, disused, uh, has to be melt to be reused uh, into buildings. Uh, scraps are cheaper. Scraps are a steel, not oxidated. All you need is uh, to melt it. So energy to remove uh, uh, oxygen is 27 times uh, greater uh, than the energy ne uh, needed uh, to melt. So uh, that is four times more uh, costly in terms of cost. And so once the amount of uh, steel saturates, then we will be able to start saving energy. So saturation is hope, actually, for the humankind. Well, then, as far as energy is concerned, uh, this is from a U.S. think tank. It's a data that generated in the last uh, decade or so. When a new power plant is uh, built, how much electricity is being generated from that? It's a plot of that. On the far right, 2018, which is last year, as of last year, renewables, including wind and mega solar, the so-called mega solar, large scale solar, four cents uh, per kilowatt hour, and then comes gas, and then coal, and nuclear power. Well, uh, we were sorry to the rest of the world when Fukushima happened. With uh, 311, Fukushima had an accident, and we have started to spend so much cost and safety uh, for nuclear power uh, plants. It, as a result, the cost has risen to 16 cents. So we have a lot of renewables in terms of volume it's sufficient. 10,000 times more energy can be derived uh, from solar rays alone. So with uh, one over 10,000 of energy available, uh, we are able uh, to fuel the whole world. And no doubt we will be heading toward that direction. So what could new power plants uh, do last year in terms of the investment? 70% of the investment uh, in energy was directed to renewables. 25% uh, went to thermal, including gas and coal. 5% was spent on nuclear last year. So the question is how to accelerate this trend, uh, which is a challenge before us. Well, in the case of Japan, Close to 90% of the energy consumed in this country uh, depends on fossil fuels. However, energy consumption in this country is declining. Uh, this is uh, 
the main common characteristic of developed countries, and that's because of saturation happening. Uh, buildings, uh, automobiles are coming to a point of saturation. Cars are replaced uh, by new ones in 12 years on average. So as new cars uh, replace old ones, uh, energy consumption declines by half. The same with buildings. Buildings are being replaced uh, in a span of 30, 30 to 40 years in Japan. And when new buildings uh, replace old ones, energy consumption is halved. They are more comfortable and much more energy conserving. This is very good news for the humankind. So once saturation is reached, energy consumption declines, no need uh, to extract uh, from underground uh, resources, uh, the same with rare earth. So mining, extraction, free. That's what humankind is going to be. I think it's a source of hope for everyone. Well, I uh, cut the very long story short, but what is sustainability ultimately uh, for the earth to be sustainable and for humans to be sustainable? So humans and the earth, which are connected by society and for society to be sustainable. Uh, we need to keep the earth beautiful Humans need to enjoy rich and affluent lives, and they must uh, be able to have self-realization. I'm 74 years old. In my time, uh, uh, there were uh, always new things uh, that uh, one would wanted. When I was an elementary uh, school student, I wanted a uh, monochrome TV, and then came refrigerator, uh, and then automobile. And when automobiles became prevalent, saturation is being reached. So uh, with pending saturation, how can we create a better society? And that is about uh, resource uh, self-sufficiency, harmony with nature, lifelong independence or self-reliance, and diverse options being provided, and freedom. And these are the aspects of a platinum society that we advocate for. These are the conditions necessary for a platinum society. And I will not uh, discuss all the details, uh, but this is possible. If humans can be smart, in their behaviors, we're convinced uh, that such a platinum society can be realized. The question is, who's going to take action for this? Uh, Dr. Lovins uh, is uh, in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, he has done very innovative experiments, and so I respect him utterly uh, because of being so innovative. There's so much that we need to do. Uh, we need uh, to translate our words into action. That is what is uh, required of us, including myself. There is hope. By 2050 or so, the energy cost will approach close to zero. And the reason is, be it they windmills or solar panels, solar power generation, uh, be they hydro uh, power generation uh, plants, it's the question of initial costs. And of course, maintenance costs uh, to some level will be required, but it's going to be quite cheap. So if we can pay for the initial costs right now, that could be a positive gift uh, to the future generations. So in that regard, uh, we may have to pay quite a lot in terms of energy costs uh, today, but uh, between 2050 to 2100, uh, the costs will uh, start to uh, decline, logically speaking. And another aspect is by 2050, ultimately, uh, we will be able to achieve a recycle-based uh, society with renewable energy.
I talked about the example of steel and iron ore. Uh, another pending urgent issue is what to do with plastic. Plastic is a crucial issue. Another is bioresources, biological resources. How can we maintain and sustain them? Foods and timber, woods, forests. We need to have sufficient discussions on these and make these all sustainable. But in my view, affluent and sustainable earth where no one is left behind, an inclusive society as such, if we can be smart enough, uh, this is a very realistic dream that we can achieve. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Komiyama. It doesn't seem that they've heard all the great intervention from you, Mr. Komiyama, yet, and from uh, Amri Lavens and other speakers before, because um, it uh, is not yet the case that the uh, political decision-making of the G20 is really in line with internationally agreed documents such as the Paris Climate Agreement or the uh, SDG framework. And what we hear from recent um, outcomes, communiques from the finance ministers, there's, um, there's not really this um, spirit of urgency reflected in, in, in the uh, documents yet. And for that reason, F20 um, uh, and Brookings Institution and um, Boston University have um, uh, together um, uh, put a report on recommendations how to make sustainable infra or how to make infrastructure investment sustainable. And I'm glad to introduce to you Mr. Amar Bhattacharya now on stage. Amar, please um, come on stage, who is the senior fellow of the Global Economy and uh, Development Program at Brookings Institute and one of the core phase, I should say, of the subject of sustainable infrastructure investment. Amar, the floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Stefan. Um, all I can say is uh, uh, I wish every G20 leader heard the previous three speakers. Um, so it's uh, really good to, to have uh, the art of the possible uh, inspiring them, uh, but also in an evidence-based way. So from that high level, I'm going to turn to the world of policy and uh, the, the role of the G20. Um, and uh, I'm going to base my presentation from three perspectives. Uh, the new climate economy report of 2018, with which I was associated, one of the authors. Uh, second, the, the paper that we produced for the F20. And third, in a lot of this work, I will draw on extensive joint work with uh, Professor Nicholas Stern, uh, you know, with whom I have been working on these issues uh, for some time. So the theme of the first one is uh, very much embodied in what uh, President Zidio said, uh, uh, which was very much urgency scale, and uh, what Amory Lovin said about opportunity. Uh, I want to come back a little bit to the notion of infrastructure, the central role that infrastructure plays in this, uh, in this challenge. Energy is one of the systems, but I want to talk about the other systems. I want to talk about G20, because that's, the, that's a critical political body in driving change, but why we need to accelerate change and why we are failing in that task. So um, even since the, you know, the landmark agreement of Par uh, Paris, as President Zidio pointed out, we are learning that not only was ambition not enough in Paris, but the science is telling us that even since then we have moved in a world where the case for scaling up, the case 
for acceleration has become even stronger. And we are learning very much again from the science that the difference between the one and a half degrees and the two degrees is not a trivial one. There was a paper just came out yesterday that showed in fact the health, uh, the health costs associated between these two are very, very significant. And so it's not, it's, it's, it's not surprising therefore that the UN Secretary General has moved very much now the, the needle to the one and a half degrees. And indeed, that must be the, 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 the North Star in terms of our effort. And as we, as we heard very powerfully, we are in a, in a situation where we can easily meet that if we have the political will and the resolve. So, sorry, this thing is frozen. Let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, I was going to move the mouse, yeah, okay. Um, so, I think I moved a lot of slides, okay. So let me quickly come to what does it mean in terms of the emissions targets? And again, this is science-based, it's very clear. If you want to reach the one and a half degrees, because we are talking about concentrations, we need to be able to cut emissions by 50% by 2030 and we need to be at net zero by 2050. For two degrees, it's 20% by 2030, and net zero by about 2075. Now, we are entering into a period that's really a moment in history because of the economic transformations that are going to happen largely in emerging markets and the developing world. Essentially, during this period of time, the world economy will double, the stock of infrastructure will double in the next 15 years or so, urban space will double in the next 20 years, and urban population in the next 40 years. So these transformations are really once in a history transformation, and as we just asserted, that transformation has to happen while at the same time cutting emissions you know, by 50% in the short run and going to net zero. That tells you two things that are very important. It tells you that even if all of the new infrastructure was zero emission, we would have to cut emissions of the existing infrastructure by that amount of magnitude. And that means that we have to accelerate aging and polluting infrastructure, largely in the advanced countries, even in countries like China and India, and we have to make sure that all the new infrastructure that is being built is built to high standards of uh, sustainability and low emissions and, carbon and climate resilient. The story that has been laid out before is that costs are declining, not just in renewable and energy. The technological changes, as we heard, are happening in materials. They are happening in the digital space that affect both the production side and the demand side. But there are two other elements that are very important in this transition to low carbon climate resilient. One is, if we did this, the core benefits, as we heard, would be very significant, less pollution, less congestion, better health outcomes, better ecosystems. So very, very significant core benefits associated with this. And second, huge avoided costs, which may basically says that this is really the only long-term future that the planet has. But the pace at which we are moving, notwithstanding the opportunities, is just too slow. Now, one aspect that we haven't talked about, and I think is extremely important to mention, is the importance of putting attention on transitions and what is being called the just transition. With the Gilets Jaunes in Paris, and you know, with kind of the coal miners talked about in Pennsylvania, it's extremely important to be, have, be smart in thinking about transitions, not coming from the low carbon transition alone, but from technological change, from globalization, you know, 
all these forces and, and from the, in terms of the future of work, but managing these transitions will be of crucial importance in getting a sustainable outcome. And the reality is that most advanced countries did not manage these transitions well, and we know that there are real good solutions that could have been applied. Okay, very co quickly coming to infrastructure. Infrastructure is the glue that ties together the sustainable development goals. It's the backbone of inclusive growth. It is what empowers people and enables them to participate in terms of human, uh, human skills, in terms of good health, and it is key to environmental sustainability. So it is not surprising that there has been tremendous focus on infrastructure since the milestone agreements of 2015. But we recognize that infrastructure is quintessentially complex because we are really investing in future generations. We are making choices about networks. Externalities are the dominant feature of infrastructure and the choices that we make will endure for a very, very long period of time. And as I have mentioned, we now add to that the urgent challenge to cut carbon emissions. So getting this policy framework right for infrastructure is done right in very, very few countries. It's certainly not done right in many developing countries, but it is not done right in the United States. And there are three reasons for it we find it first very difficult to make decisions. Decisions are made on short-term political cycles, but we are deciding the fate for generations to come. But it often is that we are, you know, a, a major reason for gridlock is decisions don't get made. Second, we typically make the wrong decisions. And third, we face tremendous problems of integrity and corruption in the infrastructure arena. So getting this right is very important, and we have to operate and think about this in the key systems. We heard very powerfully about energy, but there are equal actions that are needed on cities, on food and land use and natural infrastructure, on water, and of course on industry as we heard as well. And we also learned from Amory Lobbins, that there is no such thing as a hard to abate sector. And so if we did all this, we will get the transformation that we need. And what we are realizing is that these transformations are actually an opportunity for a better growth. So why is it that the G20 doesn't see it that way? And if you look at the G20's agenda on climate and infrastructure, Infrastructure has featured now for almost 10 years, and climate really since the Paris Agreement. Before that, the G20 was very hesitant to get into the climate space, but in 2015, the G20 came in solidly behind the Sustainable Development Goals and the climate agenda. In the, in the Chinese presidency, it laid out action plans on both, but the real kind of pinnacle on climate came under the German presidency with what's called the Hamburg Energy and Climate Action Plan, you know. And since then, there has been a little bit of a limbo because one of the key members of the G20 has said that we are dropping out of the climate uh, bandwagon. Now, why should that matter? It matters because the G20 is a consensus club. So a lot of the momentum in the G20, including in the area of green finance, has really abated, including in the area of, of uh, the uh, Hamburg energy plan. There was talk, there is now, voluntarism is good, but not when it take, goes down to the lowest common denominator, and leadership in the G20 is not headed for a higher ground. Today it is headed, unfortunately, for the least common denominator. So raising leadership in the G20, and I'll come back to this, is going to be extremely important. Last weekend, the finance ministers of, uh, at their meeting in Fukuoka uh, came out with principles of quality infrastructure, which will be uh, approved at the summit uh, 
these principles are very important because they actually do emphasize aspects of the infrastructure challenge that need to be taken into account. The importance of thinking about spillovers and benefits, the importance of thinking about economic efficiency over the life cycle of the project, e uh, environmental and social considerations, including open access, the importance of resilience, and critically, the importance of governance. All of these are very, very significant in getting a better infrastructure. But an infrastructure that is not strongly aligned with climate and with climate resilience is not quality infrastructure. I'm not saying that it is not there. It, is, it can be implicitly there, but what is striking is that the word climate really doesn't appear very strongly in the principles of quality infrastructure that were enunciated last weekend. We in the T20 came, have also done work on this in terms of quality infrastructure, and the two elements that we, are, we emphasize very much in the quality infrastructure, you have to think very much upstream if you want to produce sustainable infrastructure. It is too late to think about quality infrastructure when it is at the project level. The decisions are made long time ahead. And second point we have we made, which is very important, is you have to think about revenue models for infrastructure that are not based on the myth that current users are going to pay for the, for the infrastructure. For some aspects, that's absolutely true as we heard, but for many kinds of infrastructure, we have to think about this in a very long-term way. So let me end, I just make half a, half a point about carbon pricing. In a very recent study that the IMF came up with, has done in just last month, it shows that essentially we need carbon prices of at least $70 a ton in order to be able to meet the Paris Climate Agreements. And if you see the blue lines on the right are $35 a ton, and the, uh, uh, the uh, orange ones are $70 a ton. And if you did that for the G20 as a whole, you could get a 35%. So I very much agree with what President Zedillo said, this has to be a primary instrument. And of course, the first step is getting net rid of negative carbon prices, which is uh, fossil fuel subsidies. I won't spend time on this. The G20 has a significant role in development finance, but at the moment it's quite meager. Um, I'm sure that Ma Jung will talk about, uh, uh, about this, uh, the importance of alignment and of green finance. So let me end with just this particular slide. And I want to say that this slide highlights what are the big ticket items for the G20. So right now, the most important thing for the G20 is leadership and coming behind the one and a half degrees. That is the most significant thing and committing their own pathways. Second, it is for finance ministers to take a much more active role. On the policy side, as I said, carbon pricing, elimination of fossil fuel subsidies. On finance, I want to end on this one. On finance, why is finance important? These investments can pay for themselves, but in emerging markets and developing countries, there is a critical shortage of access and of cost of capital. And for that, we need the development finance institutions to scale up, okay? At the moment, they are being held back because there isn't a consensus, particularly within the G7, to scale up these institutions. So it's extremely important for the F20 to come in and to say that let us use those instruments that we have to scale up to the ends that we need. So the G20 has a critical role to play. They have played a positive role, but if we want the transformations, the political will, the political momentum in the G20 has to be at a level that it is not at right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amar.
very, very clear message, I guess. Um, let's hope that the uh, presidency of the G20 and the heads of state of the G20 countries are listening to this. Um, it remains mentioning, or it, it bears mentioning, that um, it's not just the G20 countries, of course, and the infrastructure of the G20 countries that matters. But many of the G20 countries, of course, cover a broad range of um, other um, infrastructure programs covering uh, more than uh, 50 or 60 other countries as well. So um, the, um, the, the guidelines for infrastructure investment in the next years will not only be applied then um, in, the in the 20 countries, but in many, many other countries as well, especially in countries of the Global South. So we will take a closer look into this question of infrastructure uh, investment on a fantastic panel that is now coming up. Uh, and I'd like to introduce to you Emmanuel Guerin, who will be the uh, moderator of this session. Emmanuel has been working for the philanthropy sector, for think tanks, for the um, government um, in particular. He is now the executive director uh, of international affairs of the European Climate Foundation. And I should say, I know you don't like this, uh, Emmanuel, but I should say that you have been deeply involved with basically designing the Paris Agreement. So what we are discussing here is indeed of importance for you. So please feel free to introduce our speakers of the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, um, Stefan, for uh, the very kind uh, introduction and to our uh, Japanese colleagues for uh, the um, invitation and uh, let me um, immediately invite my um, co-panelist uh, on stage even uh, before giving a few words of introduction to set the framework and, and the tone for uh, this uh, panel. So let me invite uh, first um, Athena uh, Balesteros uh, from the Growald Family Fund. Um, Athena, welcome. Let me um, invite then uh, Michio uh, Morisawa uh, from the Carbon Disclosure uh, Project uh, Japan. <laughs> Let me invite uh, then Felix uh, Mattis uh, from the uh, Oko Institute. Let me also invite Majun, uh, who is wearing uh, many different hats, but I must say all of them very elegantly and effectively, um, including the China Green Finance Committee and the G20 Green Finance uh, Study Group. <clears throat> Let me invite Catherine uh, Haworth uh, from Share Action. And finally, uh, let me invite Frank Riesbermann uh, from the Global Green Growth Institute. Okay, so the presentations are uh, made, and for uh, those of you who know our uh, speakers, uh, you know that we've got a, um, um, a great um, breadth um, of very different perspectives uh, to the topic uh, that we're uh, going to discuss uh, during this uh, panel that range from uh, the um, economics to uh, the finance to the policy and also I hope uh, that we will go um, into uh, uh, the politics. Um, let me say just a few words um, of introduction to set the framework for uh, this discussion uh, before uh, turning to uh, Felix. Uh, First, um, uh, the first uh, thing I want to say, and um, in fact, um, it's been um, emphasized by um, Amar um, in his presentation, is that, um, of course, um, we've been discussing the topic um, of sustainable um, infrastructure um, in the context of the G20 for uh, quite a while um, now. Um, and uh, we've made, I think, uh, some progress um, uh, during the past few years, um, in particular, um, as Amar um, said, um, under uh, the uh, leadership of the Chinese presidency of the G20 um, and after that of the German uh, presidency of the G20. Um, uh, but I think we can all um, easily um, uh, 
agree uh, that we've not done enough um, and not nearly enough, um, in fact, in the topic um, of sustainable uh, finance. And I think this is for uh, two main reasons. Um, I mean, the first is that, um, um, of course, it's, it's one thing to concentrate uh, on the buildup of sustainable um, infrastructure, um, and we've seen progress on that um, in the past. Uh, but you also need to look at the other side um, of the equation, um, in a way, um, which is... Uh, the brown or um, high carbon um, infrastructure. Um, and here, um, unfortunately, um, uh, we've also seen um, a lot of that type of infrastructure uh, being built um, in, in the past few years, uh, be it on um, oil, on gas, but also on coal, uh, which is uh, something that um, um, is particularly uh, relevant um, in this uh, region. So I think in the comments that are uh, going to be made uh, during this panel, it's important to concentrate both um, um, on the, on the build-up of the sustainable infrastructure um, and what's the uh, framework to incentivize that, uh, but also um, uh, the framework that needs to incentivize uh, the phasing out um, of the uh, unsustainable um, infrastructure, um, in particular um, on coal. Uh, the second point is, of course, that we've seen um, an increase in sustainable infrastructure. Uh, but um, I think we can, again, pretty easily um, agree uh, that the speed and the scale um, of the build-up of this infrastructure um, is nowhere near um, it needs to be, in particular if you bear in mind uh, the conclusions from the 1.5 degrees Celsius special report um, of the IPCC. Um, and so in making our recommendations to the G20, I think it's, it's really important to keep... Uh, in mind uh, the issue of scale um, and the issue of speed, um, again, as was uh, pointed out by earlier uh, speaker. So I'll, I'll leave it there for uh, the introduction. Um, invite um, uh, Felix uh, first to give a few words, which um, I think uh, will uh, set the scene for uh, the rest of the discussion. Um, and then we will uh, follow the order um, uh, that is uh, that is planned. Um, I would encourage everybody to be uh, rather uh, short in their um, introductory um, remarks and and focus on uh, what you want the um, the audience to uh, uh, to remember um, in your um, presentation, so that we can um, have a second round um, of exchange uh, where hopefully we can build up on the comments uh, made uh, by uh, the others. So, Felix. Yeah. Thank you very much. If you, if I could have the remote control. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. So the, my perspective is a little bit different than the, than the perspective of the keynote speakers. I have worked for more than 30 years on implementation on, of energy and climate policy. And so my, my perspective is more the lessons learned from the machine room uh, of energy and, and climate policy. And I think I would like to highlight essentially two issues. If you could start the presentation. Uh, the first is why we need holistic approaches. And I think if you really look through the history of energy and climate policy, and if you have a look on countries or jurisdictions which have been successful or have been not that successful, then essentially it is about how carefully and how semantically, semantically uh, uh, four different strategy have, uh, strategies have been addressed. The first, uh, and this is uh, the very popular uh, in our scene and among politicians, is paving the way for the clean options. It's creating the new jobs. It's the good news. The bad news is it requires high upfront costs. And the third uh, challenging news, it depends on the ability, the capability to manage structural change because it is, about, it is not about technologies, it's not about costs, it's about new types of technologies, new structures of cost, new uh, uh, structure of players, and new spatial patterns of, of the energy system. And managing this structural change is key. This is about energy efficiency, electrification, renewable energies, CCS, etc., etc. It is about technologies, but more important, it is about market design. Uh, because uh, if you hear uh, Emory, and you can ask the question, why, why, why does this not happen? It's essentially an issue of market design. 
it is getting much more complicated if you if we come to the second point uh, if we really take seriously the challenge of global uh, of global warming or global climate change it is there is a need to design the exit game for the non sustainable capital stocks uh, so we have not enough time to wait until these high carbon assets are coming to the the end of their economic lifetime and so it is about coal it is about petroleum products but uh, not for today, but in a few decades, we will need to discuss the phase out of natural gas. Uh, and the same will apply to high carbon industrial processes. And that tables the issues what with the people, what with the regions, and what with just transition. I spent the second half of last year in the German phase out co coal phase out commission, and definitely uh, the design of the exit game is no fun. Uh, and this is one of the key barriers for sufficient climate policies. The third is that we need to trigger infrastructure adjustment suffi with sufficient lead times. So we need to leave the myth behind that uh, the carbon pricing or the market will deliver all the options. Uh, there, there, will, there is a need for making infrastructure decisions and in, in my country where we need uh, uh, planning and licensing and implementation time for, for new infrastructure of 15 years, we need to make decisions 15 years in advance, and that, ne that means we, we need to make decisions for different, for different uh, uh, infrastructures, electricity, gas, high heat, hydrogen, maybe CO2, and definitely transport. And it is not only about upgrade, it is also about downgrade, it's about overlay and transformation. And there we have the issue of regulation, but also of raising acceptance of the people. And the fourth, uh, and that is again famous for politicians, is making innovation work in time. Innovation will play a major role, but having said this, we already know what options we uh, are available for the next 20 years, and so uh, to have a careful differentiation between implementation and planning for innovation for the next phase is important. And I think it is important to highlight these four strategies. And if it comes to my country, my country has been pretty successful in, in, in strategy number one and four. And we have major delays and major deficits in strategies number two and three. And the result is that the emissions don't decrease as fast as it would be needed. And I think I would highlight we need to have a symmetric approach to address these four strategies. What does it mean for the, for the G20? And I think from my perspective, there are essentially three major issues which need to be dealt with at the level of a G20. There, we need to have an exchange on best practices on on, on, on targets as well on strategies and implementation mechanisms. We need to focus on technologies, but we need much more focus on market design and just transition. And I think we, we need a careful consideration what the success factors, but also what the factors for failure will uh, have been. And I think there is a role for the F20. I've, I've been a part of many government exchanges, and government exchanges on best practices tend to tell the success stories. Govern, governments can't do differently. But the, the, the more valuable lessons learned are often from the failures. And there is a need for a platform which also discusses the failures and the lessons learned from the failures. The second is we need to, deba we, we need to have a very careful debate on rational policy mixes, because it is not longer on incremental changes where we work through the emission abatement cost curve from the cheap options to the expensive options. We don't have enough time to do so. And that means we need to have more comprehensive policy approaches for transformative modernization instead of incremental modernization. That includes that we need to highlight uh, the, uh, that, the, that we need to have 
have an exchange on an enlightened use of carbon pricing. From the incentive perspective, I, I agree that this is an, an important part of the, of, of the policy mix, but we also need to, to have a discussion on the revenue recycling from carbon pricing mechanisms, because this will be a key element to enable just a tradition, a, a transition, and we need to have a conversation on carbon pricing to limit the debate and to limit the barriers which arise from the debate on carbon leakage. Last but not least, uh, what the energy transformation and this transformative modernization of the energy infrastructures will also trigger that we will see a new international interrelations. And what we urgently need is a governance system for internationally traded green energies. Because in many, many jurisdictions, this will play a major role. And without a global governance system on these, new, on these internationally traded green energies, we will, uh, uh, we will end nowhere. And the same, uh, the same applies uh, that we have an increasing debate uh, on, uh, the, on greening of the value chain. Because what we really, what we really can learn is besides all the uncertainties of the future energy system. We know it needs to be carbon free, it will be capital intensive, it will be coordination intensive, it will be infrastructure intensive, and it will also be, at least in some parts, resource intensive, and we need to green the value change, which is an international subject uh, in, in this world where we have a lot of, 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 shared, of shared activities if it comes to the value chain of all these green uh, new goods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Felix, for uh, sharing with us uh, some of the lessons coming from Germany and more generally from Europe, where um, indeed uh, uh, some of these issues are very live um, uh, politically, um, and um, also for um, sharing with us some very concrete um, recommendations on what should be the role of the G20 and, and the F20, and particularly um, agree with you that the uh, point number two in your uh, strategy and the retirement um, of the high carbon infrastructure um, is going to become more and more um, of an issue in an increasing number of countries um, and is going to be uh, macro uh, relevant um, and therefore um, I think uh, um, an issue for uh, the G20 in the future. Let me turn uh, then to uh, Frank uh, from the Global Green Growth um, Institute um, uh, with um, I think more um, of a focus on, on the policy dimensions um, of what we're uh, discussing um, on the basis of a recent uh, report that you've just um, issued um, in the context um, of the G20. Frank. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, yes, we, we work in the practical implementation of this transition. Uh, since we are a very young organization, maybe just a word, uh, we were set up in 2012 at the a Rio plus 20 meeting by 12 countries to support this kind of transition. So we are, if you like, a club of countries like the G20, but by now we have 32 member countries uh, and another 22 in uh, accession. Basically a club of countries that are convinced that they ought to transition to a more green growth, meaning a more uh, environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive model of growth. But of course, it's not so easy. We've heard this morning from many speakers that there are wonderful opportunities, but in practice, we see two key obstacles. One is that many countries don't have the right enabling policy environment, and the other is that there isn't enough finance in at least the emerging uh, economies and developing countries where we work. So yes, we work on uh, supporting countries to have such a, what we used to call green growth plan, or now after the Paris Agreement, it's called an NDC action plan or a low emission development strategy. And Fiji, the Prime Minister proudly presented the Fiji low emission development strategy uh, at the last COP. Uh, Indonesia has a low carbon development initiative now. Colombia approved this national green growth plan. So there are a number of countries that are thinking through what it takes and then to take that down to more specific actions. So the Nepal Prime Minister approved a national e-mobility plan, for instance, or Rwanda adopted recently a minimum green building compliance. Uh, so there are these policy instruments that set the scene, but yes, then you need to find uh, 
money. So what is the slogan here? Finding the trillions to make that action possible. Probably starts with the billions from development for e emerging economies and, uh, if you like, uh, developing countries. But it has to involve the private sector then. So how do we combine the relatively small amounts of money from development aid or the Green Climate Fund to come together with sovereign investments that will be necessary and then to attract the private sector. We do see opportunities, indeed, as we've been hearing here, in general, there are good technologies. So uh, that translates, for instance, in Vietnam, a country that still plans to build coal-fired power plants, to look at their industrial parks. They have several hundred of them. And our analysis shows that it's commercially attractive to put solar on rooftops and that that could generate several gigawatts of, of energy at commercially attractive rates. But of course, companies then have to shift from a high monthly energy bill to an investment. So it comes down to simply financial engineering to arrange lease constructions, for instance, to make that action possible. So we see a lot of opportunity uh, like that to begin to move those trillions. Uh, but it's still very slow going in many countries, partly because decision makers don't know all the good news we've heard here that, yes, uh, renewable energy is now cheaper, energy efficiency can pay for itself, and so on. So, yes, as you mentioned, in the uh, G20 new uh, Climate and Sustainability Working Group, which we had in Tokyo a few months ago, we prepared a, a paper to show that green growth can be a model supporting this kind of transition. And the six recommendations we came up with there is for G20 countries to uh, join wonderful initiatives like the Power Past Coal Alliance or indeed the Zero Emission Initiative of the C40 cities or the RE100 that stimulates the private sector to become 100% renewable. So those are great. Uh, but just for developing countries, it's also important that the Green Climate Fund gets a good replenishment that's currently ongoing. And sadly, of course, the US won't be part of that. Wonderful to hear that Germany and Norway were among the first to double their commitment for the next round. But we do need more G20 countries to step up there. Uh, of course, the third uh, recommendation as here was that many countries still have fossil fuel subsidies, some direct, some indirect. I last week was in Beijing in a meeting on energy access in least developed countries. And most least developed countries said, we don't have fossil fuel subsidies. But often they do have subsidized electricity prices, at least for low income families. And as long as your energy mix is predominantly fossil fuel based, you then do have fossil fuel subsidies, even though they're more hidden. Uh, and yes, uh, we think that to include the private sector more in developing and emerging economies, G20 countries could expand mechanisms like their uh, export credits or their guarantees that would make more action possible. And finally, the just transition means that we need much more awareness that there are many green jobs in this transition. We're currently doing a project to show for our members the net employment impacts of renewable energy uh, that will make this transition more easy. And finally, we need more involvement, we recommended to the G20, of civil society, foundations and other civil uh, society action groups. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for uh, sharing with us uh, some of the tools um, in, in the policy uh, toolbox uh, that is included in, in this report and indeed uh, very uh, relevant for uh, the discussion at the, at the G20. Uh, let me turn to uh, Catherine um, uh, then. Um, and so we're progressively going to shift from the discussion on the economics and the policy to the discussion on finance more uh, specifically and finance regulation because Catherine as well as um, a number of other uh, speakers on the panel has been uh, very active in, in these discussions um, in particular in the context of the uh, uh, task force on, on carbon disclosure um, and some of the European uh, regulations. So uh, Catherine, um, what would you like to uh, share with us today? Right. Yes. Yay. Technology at work. Um, so, um, yeah, wonderful to be here. And I really want to commend the F20 for this um, report on aligning G20 infrastructure investment with climate goals and the 2030 agenda. It's a, it's a fantastic 
piece of work. And um, I was just reflecting this morning um, over my breakfast on the 24th floor um, of my Tokyo hotel, um, having arrived yesterday, um, on the wonders of infrastructure. I think Tokyo is a kind of, uh, you know, looking down on the railway track um, and just seeing the sort of incredibly efficient trains zipping to and fro, you realize why infrastructure is so fundamental to uh, sustainable human development. But equally well, it's important to recognize that we can get infrastructure horribly, horribly wrong. And as we try and bring private capital into um, meeting the gap, um, the multi-trillion dollar gap needed, it's incredibly important that we inform and educate the investment community about what sustainable infrastructure development looks like because um, getting it wrong is, and we do get it wrong all over the world, um, is sort of devastating, uh, particularly to biodiversity um, around the world. We're just about to pe uh, bring out a piece, um, an investor briefing on the impact of infrastructure development on biodiversity. And in Asia, in Africa, in many parts of the world, certainly actually in Europe and, and, and in North America, we have devastated biodiversity by careless infrastructure developments. So at this critical moment, and I think the point has been made really powerfully this morning, we're in a totally critical decade now. We have to kind of get it right. And as we pull private capital into infrastructure spend, which is necessary and I think can happen. I'm, I'm going to reflect a bit on, on the thinking that I see going on in the private capital market sector on this. Um, we just really do need strong guidelines, and I think the F20 can play a very powerful role in informing um, private investors, pension funds, insurance companies, as they make bigger investments in infrastructure to make sure that those sustainable development guidelines are really written in. Um, so... There's a 3.2 trillion per year gap um, in the infrastructure need um, to kind of meet the, the 2030 agenda and the Paris Climate Agreement. And there's 80 trillion uh, sitting in private capital markets in assets under management of pension funds and insurance companies and, and indeed private foundations, um, part of that sort of 80 trillion. So the, the capital is there. It's just a question of sort of making sure that we... we get it in the right um, places and spaces, and we, we, we apply these kind of sustainable development guidelines to the application of that capital spend on infrastructure. And one thing I would say is that there's been a dramatic shift, a very positive one, in the last even 18 months um, in the consciousness of sustainability within um, the private investment uh, sector. So we see that in the enormous growth of the principles of responsible investment. We get Fiona Reynolds will be here this afternoon talking about um, uh, the amazing work that the PRI is doing globally. But it must be said that um, if you actually look at the biggest investors in the world, it's really quite a small number of leaders who are truly integrating sustainability principles into their decision making. And there's a lot that are sort of beginning to nod, beginning to think about it and focus on it, but really are still not applying a kind of sustainability due diligence process to capital allocation um, decision making processes. So best, best practice exists. But, um, and, you know, in, in that sense, the future is here, but it's not very widely distributed yet in terms of the investment community. And I think the, the big shift that now needs to take place is for investors to really start thinking about not just how environmental risk could impact their returns, but how their investment decisions are impacting the environment, to, to move to a more impact-focused uh, framework for mainstream uh, investors as they think about the sustainability challenges of the future. And again, you know, tiny numbers of global investors are beginning to grasp that. And I, I really want to commend some of the Nordic investors, some of the North European investors, um, pension funds, who are really committing to allocating capital in alignment with the 2030 agenda and thinking about um, the impacts they make when they um, make investments. So how do we get from, from where we are today with the investment community to where we need to be? I think um, a couple of sort of frameworks need to be in place. We need to really reimagine um, what we mean by the fiduciary duty um, of investors. So pension funds are looking after assets for millions and millions of ordinary working people. 
And at the moment, they define their obligation to those people in rather narrow terms of, well, we're just going to try and maximize investment returns over a fairly short time horizon, and then we've met our fiduciary duties. And of course, that's a very well-intentioned framework, but it's really failing um, people who are going to retire in 30, 40 years who are putting money into a pension fund today. And if their pension funds are not taking account of climate impacts, I think we have to acknowledge it's a major failure of fiduciary obligation to act in the best interests of those individuals. So we need a, a really new model of fiduciary duty that takes account of externalities created by investments made on behalf of pension savers and acknowledges that those externalities are impacting um, the long-term well-being of, of those um, working people who put money into pension funds and then entrust that uh, investment professionals are acting in their best interests. So that's the first thing. Then associated with that, I think we need to have a framework of investor due diligence around environmental impact and also human rights impact. We're beginning to see um, quite powerful due diligence frameworks coming into the corporate sector through legislation in, company, in countries like Switzerland, in France, um, and, but we don't yet have investor due diligence frameworks built into legal um, requirements for investors. So I think that's um, a major sort of step that we need to take in the next decade, and we need to move there really fast. And in that context, I just want to commend the EU's Sustainable Finance Action Plan, which I think is um, a pretty ambitious framework, uh, which has emerged just in the last sort of two and a half, three years. Um, we've just had elections at EU level, and I'm personally quite encouraged that the, the makeup of the new European Parliament is going to lead to hopefully an acceleration of Europe's leadership around the sustainable finance agenda. But what we're seeing out of the EU is new legislation which will require Europe's large investors, pension funds and, and uh, insurance companies and asset managers to truly acknowledge um, and report on the sustainability implications of all of their investment decision making. So that's quite um, transformational, potentially. Um, it must be said that the investment industry is a bit nervous about this. Um, there's some uh, anxiety about adding these uh, extra, as they're seen, sort of burdens of um, additional uh, decision making into the process for investment um, and capital allocation. But what gives me hope that we will continue the journey in Europe um, uh, is that there's very significant growing public consciousness around all of this. I mean, people are on the streets in Europe. Um, demonstrating, uh, and, and obviously all over the world um, as well, um, around climate goals. And, and you know, we've had, just in the last two or three months in the UK, a lot of action on the streets um, around climate change. Um, and the great Greta Thunberg you know, paid a visit to London and got everybody going. And, and you know, in the last 24 hours, Theresa May, a, a politician who's kind of limping off the global stage, uh, poor woman, but she has put in place legislation which will require the whole of the UK economy to get to net zero by 2050. This is actually very radical new legislation promised in the last 24 hours. And it's coming from this kind of spirit from the street, I think. And that's also infecting the investment community because at the end of the day, all of those citizens are also members of pension schemes. So we're seeing a very sort of positive, um, strongly sort of virtuous circle, I think, of, of, of dynamic um, around that. And I mean, our, our pensions minister in the UK wrote a piece in the, in the Times newspaper um, a fortnight ago saying, we must make pensions assets a solution for the climate emergency. The climate emergency is a phrase that just came into currency just in the last kind of couple of months. And now we've got our pensions minister pledging that pension assets ought to be at the service of um, addressing the climate emergency. So, this is really positive, um, a, a really positive sort of a new emerging dynamic. So final three quick points on, on what pension funds and insurers can do. They need to decarbonize their portfolios. Um, and I, I really want to kind of pick up on one of the points that um, Amory Lovins was making, that we, we can dematerialize and um, 
a lot of our industrial processes, and we can create enormous energy efficiencies. But that means that the owners of our big industries, whether it's chemicals or tech or cement or retail or agriculture, which are pension funds and insurance companies, have to be sending these strong signals down to the boards of companies that they want to see serious investment in the dematerialization of processes, the energy efficiencies that can be achieved. You know, we, we've seen the models, it's doable, but we need the owners, the capital owners of industries to be sending that signal down. And it's beginning to happen, very positive. Second, we need allocation of capital into new green assets um, and infrastructure assets in particular. And thirdly, we actually need to see the investment industry become much more vocal in demanding the public policies from governments that will get us on track. So, um, uh, you know, where is the voice of the investment industry? It's emerging around the, the, the meeting of finance ministers as part of the G20. We, we need to have much stronger signals coming out of the investment community that can we have the public policies? Can we have the end to fossil fuel subsidies and so on? I think that's a third very important role for the private um, investment industry to play. And if we get all those things right, then we will indeed unlock the trillions and um, meet the goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, uh, for these um, extremely rich and precise and detailed uh, points, which um, um, I think um, are um, absolutely spot on. Um, and I do share uh, with you your um, optimism regarding the, uh, the future of um, climate action in the European Union um, after the European elections. I mean, there, there are challenges in Europe, uh, that is, that is uh, for sure. Uh, but, but I do agree with you that um, the broader um, political uh, dynamics uh, definitely point in the direction of doing more, um, and in particular um, in the era um, of sustainable uh, finance. So let's stay on the same topic, but um, uh, bring a different uh, perspective, um, in particular a different geographical uh, perspective and continue with uh, Majun. Um, those of you who've been part of these activities on the G20 know that uh, Majun has been a relentless um, uh, advocate for uh, sustainable finance um, in this context for a while um, now, together uh, with um, Amar uh, Batasharia, who you've um, um, heard uh, before. Um, and Majun, we're uh, very interested in um, hearing from you, I guess, from, from two different perspectives. I mean, one is uh, um, the perspective of the G20, um, of course, and what is the next step in terms of uh, what needs to be done on the topic of sustainable uh, finance and the role of the central banks and, and other uh, bodies. Uh, but also, uh, because there is probably um, nothing uh, that is more significant today in the world of sustainable finance uh, than the Belt and Road um, Initiative. Um, and um, um, I know that you're um, also um, extremely um, active in, in this space and a force for uh, the good and pushing for uh, green investment uh, principles. Uh, we would be um, interested, um, I think, all um, in hearing from you, uh, both as a global citizen and as a Chinese uh, citizen um, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. And also, I'd like to thank F20 for inviting me to uh, this very interesting discussion on climate and uh, sustainability. As Emmanuel said, I'm wearing many different hats. Uh, one of them is the chairman of the China Green Finance Committee that was set up by the central bank to promote green finance domestically in China. And also, last three years, I was co-chair of the G20 Green Finance Study Group. Um, and this group is no longer existing this year, uh, but uh, some of the green elements are getting into the infrastructure working group. Also, I chair the um, NGFS, or the Central Banks and Supervisors uh, uh, Network for Green and Financial System, uh, for its uh, supervision work stream. And uh, also, I run the uh, Green Finance Research Center in Tsinghua University. Now, let me just uh, touch upon a few things. One is what China has been doing very briefly on green finance, and then the uh, G20 effort, which we kicked off in 2016, and moving on to the Belt and Road, uh, which I think is uh, a critical part of uh, our green agenda, especially in light of the, uh, the climate <coughs> uh, perspective. Now, within China, um, we kicked off what we called a green financial system um, in 2014, at that time, we formed a task force on green finance. Uh, 
And uh, this task force launched uh, 14 recommendations. Now, the idea is that uh, we need to mobilize 4 trillion RMB per year for green and low carbon investments, but the government has no money. The government can only cover like 10% of the uh, green investment demand, and 90% of the money has to come from the private sector. That's why the financial system has to make uh, a huge contribution to mobilize um, these 90% of the green money. And uh, <clears throat> what it means is that uh, we need to use all kinds of financial instruments, not just a loan, uh, but also you know, bonds, equities, uh, funds, insurance, you know, every possible financial instruments to mobilize green financing and also use incentives and standards and uh, uh, many other things to promote the uh, green finance development. Essentially, in my view, at that time, at the head of the task force, was that we have to take a top-down approach. The bottom approach, or what somebody called the market-based approach, didn't work, uh, simply because the market had a big failure. We end up with a situation of <clears throat> uh, this climate challenge. That's why we have to use the government to drive you know, most of the change in the green finance field. So we did four things uh, over the past uh, few years. One is we created a system of taxonomies for green financing. Um, a system, I mean, we have now three different taxonomies. One is for green lending. We define what green loans should finance. And uh, uh, that was done at least, uh, uh, actually it was seven years ago. It was a very simple one pager, 12 lines. And uh, the second taxonomy was for green bonds, uh, which we kicked off in 2015. It was much more developed. It was 10 pager and 31 categories. The recent version of taxonomy is called Green Project Taxonomy. Uh, that was done jointly by the seven ministries. It was 60 pages, 200 subcategories. It's by far the most detailed, implementable green taxonomy in the world. And uh, I'm sure many other countries are moving in that direction, but eventually we need to harmonize the green taxonomy as a basis uh, for financing to uh, locate you know, uh, their money into the right space, and right sector, and right companies. The second piece of work on the green finance uh, system in China is what we call incentives. We realize that many of the green projects have externalities, positive externalities, um, and most of these externalities cannot be paid for by the recipients, simply because if you reduce carbon, you benefit 7 billion people. How can the 7 billion people pay you? They don't pay you and the projects are not profitable enough as a result. So the government has to incentivize them, or we find other ways to incentivize them. And we put in a couple of incentives. At the central bank level, uh, we introduced what we call the green re-lending facility. Namely, the central bank provides low-cost financing to the banks, and banks are asked to provide low-cost loans to the uh, green projects. At the local government level, we encourage all of them to be innovative on you know, introducing their own incentives in the forms of uh, interest subsidies uh, and the guarantees and the local government uh, investments, you know, by their own funds. According to a recent study under our Green Finance Committee, the Chinese local governments have introduced 175 types of incentives for green investment projects. And uh, the goal is very simple, to reduce the funding cost and make it, you know, easier and transactionally uh, easier and uh, enhancing the return from private investor perspective. Um, that's why uh, we can crowd in you know, a lot more private capital uh, than the uh, public money or public incentives itself. The third element is disclosure. Uh, we fully realize that without disclosure, the finances, the banks, investors won't be able to find the right projects and right companies to invest. Uh, that's why we begin to introduce compulsory disclosure requirements. CSRC, which is the uh, securities regulator, announced in 2017 that by 2020, China will introduce compulsory requirement for all listed companies to disclose environmental information. And a template has been created as a draft version which include things like CO2 emission, SO2, NOx, um, COD, and the energy consumption, water consumption. These are the indicators that the listed company will have to disclose going forward. The last piece of the uh, green financial system is what we call a suite of products because uh, the different green projects require different type of financing. Some require short term, some require long term, some want money that can tolerate risk, or some you know, require more liquid financial instruments. That's why we created a suite of products including green loans, green bonds, green funds, green insurance, green ABS, green ETF, and so on and so forth. Just to give you a few numbers, uh, what we have done so far 
On the green lending side, uh, we now have a trillion RMB worth of green loans, accounting for over 10% of banking system loan portfolio. And uh, on the green bond side, uh, we created the green bond market uh, actually 10 years later than Europe. Uh, it started uh, in China in 2016, but last three and a half years, we raised 800 billion RMB worth of green bonds. And uh, in the fund space, uh, we created 400 private equity funds in the green sector. Uh, all of these numbers sound like big, uh, but still they are representing a very small proportion of the Chinese financial system. And we have a long way to go in sort of fully uh, 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 greening the, uh, the financial system. Now moving on to the international uh, initiatives, the most important one back uh, you know, three and a half years ago was the uh, G20 Green Finance Study Group. Uh, we took advantage of Chinese presidency um, of G20 in 2016 and, uh, and uh, use the opportunity to launch that study group. In that year, uh, we agreed among the 20 countries seven options to scale up green finance globally, and uh, these options were all written into the G20 leaders' communique. That's something I considered a huge success because before 2016, the G20 has not discussed green finance, sustainable finance, and uh, I would say actually many central bank and the green, uh, finance uh, uh, ministry officials were not aware of the concept of green finance, but uh, it was mainstream in that year uh, among global politicians and financial sector uh, leaders. In the second year under German presidency, the study group continued uh, working on a couple more operational issues like uh, um, environmental risk analysis uh, for financial firms and also enhancing the uh, disclosure uh, for environmental information. And uh, last year, during Germ uh, Argentina presidency, uh, we uh, delivered three more options on products, for example, securitization of green assets, as well as green P and VC. Now, uh, what I feel is that uh, uh, the G20 process, uh, as uh, one of the speakers said earlier, uh, <clears throat> it's a consensus-based club. Um, it's very hard to push for you know, very concrete and operational actions. And uh, some of these uh, options have to stay at option level. And uh, some countries even insist uh, these have to be voluntary options, uh, <clears throat> which means that uh, you know, beyond G20, we need to look for new avenues for you know, more concrete actions and implementable platforms. Uh, that's why in 2017, uh, eight central banks, what we call the Coalition of Willing, um, decided to form the Central Banks and Supervisors Network on greening the financial system. And that eight central banks included those from uh, France, China, UK, Germany, and so on. And uh, this network, over the past one and a half years, expanded to 36 members, uh, including more than 30 countries and a couple of uh, major international organizations. So I think it's a huge success in moving into a space of the financial regulators. And the NGFS, um, just uh, two months ago, issued a comprehensive report which included six recommendations that's significant. Why? Because the G20, very, uh, very, very uh, few G20 documents will issue recommendations. They only issue options. So recommendations are much stronger wording, and they send a stronger message to the financial sector. These six recommendations from NGFS uh, stated that uh, we call the central banks, supervisors, and policymakers to introduce uh, climate-related supervisory actions. Um, so they will be guiding the banks, insurance company, asset managers towards disclosing environmental climate information and uh, conducting environmental and climate risk analysis. Now, finally, <clears throat> on the topic of a Belt and Road, um, <clears throat> my view is that the Belt and Road will require most of the infrastructure investments in the coming decades. And uh, these infrastructure investments, if they are high carbon, it's going to be a disaster because uh, these projects, which are planned and done probably in the next 10 years, will lock in the carbon for the next 40 and 50 years. So it's imperative to ensure that in the near future, the uh, green investments and low carbon investments are in place in most of the Belt and Road countries, which now have 126 uh, members. And uh, this is why we launched, uh, we namely the China Green Finance Community City of London, jointly launched the green investment principles for the Belt and Road. And uh, uh, until now, we have 27 global financial firms, very large ones signed up to these principles, including all major Chinese lenders and big lenders from UK, France, um, <clears throat> Germany, uh, Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and some of developing countries. We're now expanding our membership. 
and trying to uh, enhance the capacity and build a green project database for them to share investment opportunities. And I really look forward to your support for this uh, green investment principle uh, implementation going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madrun, and sorry you had to rush at the end, in particular on the topic of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, but I know that uh, um, in particular um, Athena is very likely to talk about it, um, um, in particular from a, a recipient uh, country uh, uh, perspective. But um, as I said, if, if Madrun didn't exist, uh, we would certainly need to create at least one, uh, probably quite several, <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, the um, incredible um, activism of uh, Matt Drun on this topic is a lot of what explains uh, the progress uh, that is being made um, in China um, on this topic. Um, let's turn uh, then to uh, Michio, uh, who is uh, going to uh, bring us um, a Japanese uh, perspective on the issue as well as a uh, business uh, perspective. Thank you very much. CDP, for infrastructure to be sustainable, for important things for it to be sustainable, we believe that information disclosure is important. Companies that are doing infrastructure investment risk scenario analysis, promoting disclosure of climate information, that is going to be increasingly important. At CDP, in 2019, June 4th, just last week, new climate change report we issued. Large companies around the world are facing $1 trillion of climate change risk. 250 companies around the world, as a result of climate change, they're exposed to a risk of $1 trillion. And there is a high likelihood that that would materialize within a matter of five years. Now, climate-related business opportunities are as much as $2.1 trillion. That is double the risk. So as such, when it comes to climate change, there are risks and there are opportunities. In 2017, CDP issued C40 research deadline 2040. And according to those estimates, in order to contain temperature rise to 1.5 degrees for 40 cities by 2050, they need to invest by $1 trillion. We hear $1 trillion often here and there. Such climate change action would be needed on the part of the cities. So these types of information, we can have this information as a result of disclosure from companies and local uh, governments, best practice, which can be learned from activities of other companies, and also not by yourself, but uh, what is being done in your value chain. Uh, those are the things that will have to be watched closely. Now, expanding activities at CDP, the same is true for Catherine. What we have been doing is we have been sending questionnaires to investors, companies, and local governments about their work on climate change, and we have been getting replies and analyzing their replies. It's not just CDP. We need to work with various stakeholders to identify what should be disclosed. And we also have to promote activities for enhanced understanding on the part of the stakeholders to make disclosures. TCFD uh, made that recommendation. Now, TCFD is a framework. In the security report of uh, companies, they are promoted to make disclosure of climate change. This is not just a recommendation. It's important to make this mandatory in Europe. There are movements to make this mandatory, but here in Japan, these activities have just started. Scientific, science-based targets, SBT, as it is called, or carbon pricing. It's important for companies to set these targets and set carbon pricing, and these commitments must be monitored these quantitative com commitments must be monitored. Now, infrastructure investments. CEO is Fiona. Uh, 
uh, she's in Japan and will deliver a speech in the afternoon. In 2018, in the infrastructure investment area, for implementing ESG investment, due diligence questions were made public. ESG investment, uh, the discussion is underway in equities and debt, but the infrastructure, which is an alternative uh, investment, uh, various guidance is being created. What do investors need to do in order for them to be able to make correct decisions? You need data. There's a lot of information, but that information has to be looked at as data. And for investors to be able to make correct uh, decisions, it's not just data. You need knowledge. You need insight to be able to analyze that data. Uh, work is underway. More studies must be done. And it will need to go into the implementation stage. There's a lot of knowledge and insight coming out, using that insight to take action. That will be important, especially here in Japan. As we heard in the keynote address, we heard about knowledge and insight. We heard about various possibilities. But unfortunately, policymakers are not putting that into action. We still haven't gone to that stage yet. In order to make a change, we need proactive uh, engagement by companies, engagement by investors, so that policymakers, we need to raise our voices so that the policymakers will start to work on these agendas. People who are here do have the knowledge and insight. And these are the people who are actually taking action together with us. One of the organizers here is Renewable Energy Institute. There are a number of groups in Japan who are active in this area. We need to raise our voices. We need to make our voices heard. NGOs must be equipped with knowledge, and we are taking that action. So we want to send a message to the policymakers, decarbonization. We don't have coal as a resource. So we are still talking about just transition. For coal-producing countries, this is a very important uh, discussion. Just transition, appropriate transition. These terms are being used. But I think it's very difficult for these terms to be translated into Japan. Reasonable transition. We sometimes hear this, these words. Because what we're seeing is not reasonable. We need to make a transition. In order to make a transition, we need to be looking at employees. Miners, coal miners, no longer exist here in Japan. In countries where there are still coal miners working, just transition is a, is a very important uh, theme. We're importing coal for it to be used in thermal coal-fired plants. So it's unreasonable to continue to do so. So we need to raise our voices. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michio, for uh, bringing a Japanese perspective into this discussion, which I'm sure uh, was of high interest to many uh, in the room um, who I really uh, recommend uh, to get in touch with you um, after uh, the, the panel discussion. Um, Athena, uh, you've got the final uh, word um, on this panel, uh, which is a very important uh, position. Um, we've known each other for um, a while now, um, and you're really working in the trenches um, of both um, climate finance, coal finance, uh, renewable energy finance. Uh, it was a particular interest in uh, this region, your region, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, what what are uh, some of the important uh, facts uh, that you would like to uh, leave us with uh, today? Okay. The advantage of speaking last is I don't have to think about anything new to say. I can just recap and summarize, but also just amazed at the roster of speakers. So I want to thank and congratulate F20 and REI for a spectacular morning session. And we do have an afternoon session. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to highlight three key messages that I've heard so far, and then I'm going to offer some examples, uh, one or two examples, and bring it closer to home um, about what these messages mean to Asia, particularly Japan's relationship to Southeast Asia, where I come from. So I heard three things today that I think resonated with me. One is transformation, 
urgent transformation. Second is opportunity and opportunity for growth. That is no longer a compromise between economic growth and addressing climate change and meeting poverty and development needs. And then I heard a lot about ambition as well. So let me just offer a few closing thoughts given, given the time. And I, I know I'm standing between you guys and lunch. And some of us are probably also getting hungry. Um, just, just on transformation, I mean, our keynote speakers have emphasized that it's a, a heavy lift to transform the entire energy and infrastructure investments in many of our countries. But just to zero in on electricity, and um, I don't know if he's around, but Mr. Nobua Tanaka, who used to work for IEA, and now the chair of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, has um, emphasized his message yesterday in another event. Um, that electricity still accounts for 40% of all global emissions. And therefore, that's where majority of the activity should be in terms of shifting the paradigm, shifting policies. But it's also an incredible opportunity to work towards sustainable and equitable development. Now, we have a little bit of a problem in my part of the world, in Southeast Asia, where despite all of Amory's vision and Amar's fantastic scientific and, and um, academic studies. Um, my part of the world is leading in terms of current and CO2 emission growth, 85% um, uh, of which is gonna come from coal. We have a 70 gigawatt pipeline just between Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines at a time when we know we have to keep temperatures way below 1.5. So we do have a little bit of a problem. And this is also happening when we have countries who are beginning to announce phasing out of coal, um, mostly from, from industrialized countries through the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. But we do have a situation where Japan is playing a major role in driving um, this investment in, in coal-intensive um, activities. Japan continues to be the only G7 country building new coal um, and continued coal use. 26% uh, by 2030, as contained in its current plan. Japan's private banks continue to invest in our countries on coal, as you have alluded to. Japan is also the second biggest source of public funding for coal in the G20, when a lot of public DFIs are already facing out of coal, as your report actually uh, said. Um, and I think, more worryingly, Japanese firms um, are still investing in making decisions on coal, which potentially could be stranded assets in five, even 10 years, and partnering with local businesses in our countries. So I think we do have a situation, and, and the question for me, which hopefully the panel in the afternoon can ask is, what can we do as a community in Asia and partnering with international organizations to change this mindset and to change this paradigm? Because I really cannot wake up again and realize that we will have 40, 50 gigawatts of new coal power plants being built in this part of the world. Because that is just a lock-in effect that nobody can stop. We already have a problem of retiring aging plants. And also, what do we do with the power plants that have just been built five years ago in many of our countries? So that's a big challenge that I, I pose to all of you. Um, at the same time, I heard a lot about uh, the messaging on opportunities. Um, Last year, and I don't know if you, if you heard about this, the Development Bank of Singapore issued a report on business opportunities for ASEAN markets and economies and found that the demand for additional ASEAN green investment, um, thanks to some of the work that Ma Jun and some of the central banks guys are doing, from 2016 to 2030 is estimated at US three, uh, 3 trillion US dollars. You know, and as Kat said, this is probably where some of the resources should be going. But unfortunately, it's, it's going the other way. So it's not like we don't have an opportunity. The, the numbers are there. The economic opportunities are there. The, the um, businesses and the investors are there. Um, I think what is seriously lacking, and this is where the role of philanthropy and foundations, and particularly F20 come in, is helping unlock those policy and regulatory barriers that would really open up the markets to the catalytic um, and transformational renewable energy investments. Um, and the third piece I just want to bring is, is the, the message around ambition. I, I always wonder, this is probably the third major event in two weeks, I've been engaged in where we, uh, Emmanuel, you and I talk about how do we scale up ambition, how do we ratchet up ambition, and um, 
increase the level of ambition, particularly with the nationally determined contributions. But we also heard that with the current NDCs now, that's not even enough. That will not get us to a place where we could seriously bend the emissions curve. Um, and here I offer not a different paradigm, but a reinforcing paradigm, because I am convinced that the action really needs to come from the bottom up. We may be thinking too much of a top-down approach. Ambition has to come at national level and local level. So Fridays for Future, indigenous communities organizing, um, church and um, different types of organizations, I think those have to be part of the conversation. It's inclusive development, it's inclusive transformational development. I also wanna see more voices from women um, and more conversations around women's role in climate leadership and energy. I also wanna see more voices from entrepreneurs. Most of our economies are controlled by very few families and oligarchs. And we are beginning to work with them to talk about the business model for the future. And I think those are topics that we haven't um, really talked about. But just to end with what we as philanthropists and, and also the foundation sector are doing, and we think F20 plays a critical role in doing this, particularly given the host of next year. Um, one is I think we should continue supporting innovation, innovation in knowledge, in partnership, in entrepreneurship, um, supporting high impact and catalytic research, providing the evidence and, and generating the data for action. I think convening is a, a critical role. Uh, sometimes we are working in silos, even some of us across this table, um, I think we need to figure out how to organize even closer and better and, and coordinate strategies. And I think we have to foster new leadership. And I think leadership doesn't just have to come from the top, it has to come from movements on the ground. So thank you. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Athena, for uh, speaking very clearly and very strongly. Uh, we expected no less, and that was that was extremely useful, um, I think. Uh, you've also made my job as a moderator uh, much easier by uh, summarizing uh, not just the panel discussion, but the entire uh, morning discussion. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I'm just gonna leave you with uh, two concluding uh, thoughts before uh, we uh, all go to lunch, because I think those of us who've been uh, part of these activities of the G20 for a while know that uh, the G20 matters uh, not just from a policy perspective and, and what is included in the declaration and is sometimes buried into one of these recommendations or uh, options, but also for uh, two reasons, I think. One is the, the political direction, the political uh, signal uh, that it sends, in particular uh, the heads of state and government. And the second, which is uh, sometimes a bit under uh, valued is the, uh, the mandate that it gives to other um, international organizations for uh, conducting some very important um, pieces of work. So two thoughts on this. Uh, first, and that's basically to emphasize what Catherine uh, said before. Um, I think this is, this is very fortunate that we're um, having this discussion the day after uh, the British uh, government uh, committed to net zero emissions by uh, 2050. I think this is a remarkable uh, commitment and I just want to emphasize that I am French, that for the French to praise uh, the Brits is something that we don't do lightly, uh, but I think, I think this is uh, um, a very significant uh, uh, commitment. It includes, by the way, international aviation and shipping. It relies um, on a very limited use of um, offsets and I think this is the type of policy decisions that sends a very clear political signal um, about the direction that we um, all need to take. Um, and it's been discussed in the context of the G20 for a while um, under uh, the item of long-term strategy, but I do think that a large number uh, of other uh, G20 countries uh, should do absolutely the same um, and have uh, such a clear uh, 2050 uh, goal. Uh, the second issue, as I said, and we've, we've seen that on the topic of sustainable finance with the work that has been commissioned to uh, the network of uh, central banks, uh, the, um, the G20 is often very useful to give a mandate to these international organizations to um, conduct uh, some work. Um, I would personally argue that it would be uh, 
very useful for it, uh, the International Monetary uh, Fund uh, to be given um, a m much stronger but also much uh, more comprehensive uh, mandate um, on climate that goes way beyond uh, what it's doing right now, which is more on adaptation than mitigation, and when it comes to mitigation, uh, more um, under the auspices of the uh, fiscal department, but I think there is an agenda um, on financial uh, regulation as a part of um, Article uh, 4. So just uh, two thoughts to conclude uh, this discussion, but I want to thank uh, deeply um, all of our uh, panelists uh, for uh, sharing with us uh, their um, insights, and I want to uh, thank you for uh, being uh, patient um, and uh, going eight minutes um, over time uh, before uh, breaking for lunch. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank you, Emmanuel, for uh, chairing this um, fantastic panel. It is really quite unique to have this group of experts on one stage. Please be back at 2 p.m., so at uh, 2 o'clock. Um, the next uh, panel will be looking into more details about the renewable energy transition and it will kick off by Tasneem Esop, who is the executive director of the Climate Action Network, followed by a presentation from Sven Teske, who has done a scenario for the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, how we can actually remain under the 1.5 benchmark of Paris. So please be back at 2 o'clock. It's going to be an exciting second part of the day. Thank you. <laughs>